What would happen if we didn't sleep? Hey Crash, today we're going to learn about sleep. More specifically, what would happen if we didn't sleep? Is this because of last night? Come on, Culture, you promised we weren't going to talk about this in front of the audience. Nah, this has nothing to do with the fact that you stayed up all night eating junk food and playing video games. With the volume maxed out. So said and other people couldn't sleep. Dude, I get it. So your plan is to put me to sleep with one of your lessons. Anything to get some peace and quiet. But hey, even if you don't fall asleep, you might just learn something. So let me ask you this. What exactly is sleep? Hmm. Sleep is... Um... Sleep. I don't know. It seems easy to define, but it's really not. Perhaps the reason it seems so simple is because it's a universal truth. Everybody sleeps. It's relatable across cultures and across time. Take, for example, prehistoric people. They, of course, needed to sleep as well, but they exhibited biphasic sleep. That is, they would wake up in the middle of the night for a couple of hours and then go back to sleep. Researchers guessed that the reason for this was nighttime activities, if you know what I mean. You mean sex? I'm pretty sure you mean sex. Though now I think about it, you were probably just trying to avoid that word to keep this all G-rated. Dickhole. Yeah, thanks for that. Now in modern day cultures, we all experience sleep in pretty much the same way, but not napping. Many cultures integrate afternoon naps as part of their everyday lives. Take Spain's siestas, for example. Naps taken after lunch. Or Japan's similar concept known as inamuri, a nap taken at work in the afternoon meant to increase productivity. There are, of course, many other slight variations in exactly how we sleep, but the fact remains, we all need to sleep. Or do we? Personally, the only sleep I need is beauty sleep. In that case, you need to hibernate, buddy. Let's start by figuring out what sleep is and what it does for us. Perhaps the best way to define it is by the symptoms of sleep. Relaxation of postural muscles, closing of eyes, inactivity of the nervous system. But I think perhaps the most striking difference about sleep, compared to every other part of the day, is the almost complete apparent suspension of consciousness. Sleep is composed of five phases, each of which can be identified via electroencephalography, or EEG. EEG measures brainwaves which are synchronized electrical pulses produced by our neurons in our brain, communicating with one another. So let's run through these five phases. Stage 1 is known as light sleep, where the eyes and muscles may still move and contract, but very slowly. You know that falling sensation you sometimes get, Crash? Oh yeah, that scares the shit out of me. Happens all the time. That sensation is known as hypnic myoclonia, and is essentially an involuntary jerking motion. Unlike those, uh, voluntary jerking motions you sometimes make in bed. What the fuck, you goddamn creep! Yeah, try closing your door once in a while, Crash. In stage 2, eye movement stops, and brain waves slow drastically. We spend 50% of our time asleep in this stage, and it's characterized by two special types of brain waves. K-complexes, which are large waves resulting from environmental stimuli, for example, noises in the room, and sleep spindles, which are fast bursts of activity. However, whilst we know which areas of the brain sleep spindles occur in, we don't yet know their function. Stages 3 and 4 are known as deep sleep, and at this point the brain mostly exhibits very slow waves known as delta waves. There's no eye or muscle movement, and being woken from these stages will cause you to feel groggy, irritated, and disoriented. Deep sleep is also the time when many nocturnal activities occur, such as sleepwalking, night terrors, or bedwetting. You'd know all about bedwetting, wouldn't you, culture? Hey, I wasn't going to bring this up because I didn't want to embarrass you in front of everyone, but let's just say that I do the laundry around here, and if anyone is wetting the bed, it's you, buddy. Now oh, come on, it was one time! Anyway, the fifth and final stage is REM sleep. REM, or rapid eye movement sleep, results in shallow, irregular breathing, and, as the name suggests, twitching of the eyes. If you have a dog, you might have noticed them running in their sleep. God damn it, that's cute. Our heart rate increases and our blood pressure rises, which in guys can lead to erections. Also cute. Carry on. And of course, the weirdest thing about REM sleep is our dreams, but perhaps that's best saved for another episode. But what actually causes us to fall asleep and wake up in the first place? A large determinant in when you fall asleep is your internal body clock, or circadian rhythm, from the Latin circadian meaning around a day. This rhythm is controlled by the various levels of neurotransmitters in your body. Adenosine builds up in your body while you're awake, and at high enough levels signals the body to sleep. Then, during sleep, it's broken down again. Melatonin is released by your brain in the absence of light, creating another strong signal for your body to go to sleep. In teenagers, this melatonin release peaks later in the 24-hour cycle than for young adults. 
Hence why teenagers, and Crash apparently, seem to stay up later and sleep in later. I'm sorry you can't handle my hectic partying schedule, man. Me and Havana Brown, much like Batman and Robin, run the fucking night. Nice three-year-old song reference. A buildup of cortisol in your body signals you to wake up. This makes sense since cortisol is also known as the stress hormone, being released when you feel under pressure. This also explains why it's harder to get to sleep when you feel stressed out. For example, when you have an exam the next day or a big presentation. Of course, other external stimuli such as bright lights and loud noises can prompt our body to wake up. Dude, hurry up and get to the point. I want to know if I can go without sleep. It'll give me so much more time for my activities. Like my wax sculpting. Yeah, that's right, baby. It's a callback. I promise I'm almost there. But before we can understand if we can skip sleep, we need to know why we sleep in the first place. We have many theories about why we sleep, but little evidence. But who cares? Let's speculate wildly anyway just for fun. This is a side of you I could get used to. The inactivity theory states that sleep was developed to help us stay safe by keeping in one spot away from predators at night. In addition, the sedentary time also conserved energy, since metabolism is reduced by approximately 10% while we sleep. Restoration theory, on the other hand, puts forth that many of the major restorative functions in the body, like muscle growth, tissue repair, and protein synthesis, occur mostly, or in some cases only, during sleep. But my favorite theory has to be the brain plasticity theory, which says that sleep gives the brain time to reorganize its structure, such as turning short-term memories into long-term memories. This is incredibly important in learning, whereby knowledge gained throughout the day can be consolidated overnight. This is so interesting, I might just start consolidating some knowledge right now. A study in rats showed that certain nerve signaling patterns which the rats generated during the day were repeated during deep sleep. This pattern repetition may help encode memories and improve learning. The real answer could even be a mix of these theories. Researchers don't exactly know, but they do have a good idea about what happens if we don't sleep. In rats, trials have been conducted pushing the poor little guys until they died from sleep deprivation. They were only able to live for three weeks when deprived of any kind of sleep, compared to their usual life expectancy of two to three years. In this time period, the rats were shown to have very low body temperatures and developed sores on their appendages, consistent with a faulty immune system. Perhaps the greatest observable effect is the negative impact on the nervous system. Rats are cool and all, but I want to hear about human experiments. Well, the thing is, there haven't been many documented sleep deprivation cases in humans because, you know, ethics. However, the best documented, observed, and most definitive case is that of Randy Gardner, who, in 1963 as an experiment for his San Diego High School Science Fair, stayed awake for 11 days or 264 hours. His progress was tracked by Stanford researcher William C. Demont and his physician, Lieutenant Commander John J. Ross. Damn! Bringing in the Navy for this one! Ross's observations provide the best account for sleep deprivation in humans. By day two, Gardner was unable to focus properly. By day three, he was incredibly irritable, being subject to random mood swings. By day four, he was hallucinating. He imagined that he was Paul Lowe, a famous footballer who played halfback for the San Diego Chargers. This was particularly odd, considering Lowe was a large black man, whilst Gardner was a 170-pound white boy. All of these symptoms pointed towards negatively affected CNS functioning. However, despite these comments from the doctor, Gardner gave a speech at the end of the 11 days, in which he seemed to be perfectly fine. Furthermore, after the experiment had concluded and Gardner had gotten a good night's sleep, he reported no ongoing effects. Don't get me wrong, that's pretty impressive and all, but I think I could go longer. Well, there is actually a longer time without sleep, but it's not officially confirmed. The reported longest time without sleeping is 449 hours, as accomplished by Maureen Weston, who competed in a rocking chair marathon. This case is not as well documented, and for all we know there may have been microsleeps, where the eyes remain open but the brain is asleep. But in this case as well, there were no adverse ongoing effects. Terrific! So I can go without sleep for almost 19 days without any problems. I mean, you could, but they'd be the most painful 19 days of your life. Plus, what would you even do with all that free time? You do nothing all day as it is. Harsh. But fair. You should be getting between 7 to 8 hours a day if you're an adult. Teenagers need a little longer, about 9 hours, and babies need to sleep 16 hours out of the day. Really though, the length of sleep someone needs is individualized, and the best way to know if you're getting enough sleep is to listen to your body. One important thing to note though, our bodies do not adapt to getting less sleep over time. But my body never tells me to go sleep. Try explaining that, Kelchier. If I had to take a guess, it's probably because of all those energy drinks you slammed down. They're packed with caffeine and other CNS stimulants meant to keep you awake. 
Some diet pills and decongestants have similar side effects. Some other drugs only suppress REM sleep, such as antidepressants and heavy smoking, where nicotine withdrawal causes the smoker to wake up every few hours. Even alcohol, or as some people call it, a nightcap, suppresses REM sleep, even though it helps you fall asleep quicker. Essentially, you get a shallow, non-restorative sleep. All right, all right, stop lecturing me. I'll get some sleep if it'll keep you quiet. Thank you. It's really not your fault, though. You've been raised like this. Much of Western culture is based around industrialization, and with industrialization came this idea that sleep is just wasted time. But thanks to modern science, we know better. Sleep is just as important as diet and exercise. So make sure you get the best sleep you possibly can, because we all know... Oh yes, Wonder Woman, take it all off. Follow Culture Crush on social media! If you would like to support the show, then head on over to the Culture Crash Patreon page where you can receive rewards for your support. Every bit counts.